Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Level Up. Katie here, and in this week's episode, we are bringing you the recording from our Unbreak Your Business annual planning session, day one. This was an amazing session filled with a lot of great ideas and resources to really put a plan, solid plan together for 2023. Take a listen, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at any point. All of our contact information is in the show notes. Enjoy and have a great week. Building a successful real estate career requires you to adapt, pivot, and constantly master new skills. We're Katie and Daniel Steinfeld. We've built our own innovative brokerage. And in this podcast, we've assembled actionable tips and strategies that you can implement to take your business to its maximum potential. It's time to level up. Level up. And we're off to the races. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. It's time to unbreak your business. How about that? How's that sound? <laughs> so just a qu- quick note, I have shared in the chat the PDF, this resource that we're going through. Um, so you guys can have that, download it. You may use it for yourselves. So that is there for everybody to download right now. Yeah. So take a minute to get that. If you've got a printer, it's printable. If not, just follow along. We're going to be showing you the same things on our screen as we go. Um, But there is some interactivity that uh, either can be done simultaneous to what we're talking about, or obviously once we're all done, feel free to take the time. And we encourage you to take the time to do any exercises that are here for yourself, because it'll help push things along. and yeah, so let's let's just jump into a bit of an intro here. Um, tell you a bit about us. I think most of the people here we know. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, I'm Daniel, and here with Katie, we are the owners of On the Block Realty. Um, some of you might know us from the podcast Level Up, podcast for realtors. Um, I feel like that Troy McClure guy on The Simpsons. <laughs> no you don't know is that a bad reference no i know i'm just you trying may to also like... remember us from such oh, other right. podcasts yes i was trying to remember level up. i know yeah on the block <laughs> you should get Troy the otb 100 um so we uh have put together in the in the past um some sessions in prior years i just referenced the otb 100 which is a a a system that we had put together or a series of seminars in prior years for the last hundred days of the year um super useful still available on zoom in different ways but i think uh we've really thought that it's important from a maintaining people's attention making things a little bit easier to digest a little bit more relevant and focused to turn this into a very uh, condensed and focused two day, two hours a day plus or max, not plus max two hours. We're here all day, everybody. Two hours Just... plus <laughs> two hours max, uh, each day today and tomorrow session where we are going to jump into the most important things needed to kind of dissect and put back together your real estate business, no matter what position or spot or timeline you're at in your career right now. That's right. Yeah. So we're hopefully going to be able to interact with you guys as much as possible throughout this presentation. Feel free to, as Daniel said before, put your cameras on, get into the chat, um, speak up. Um, We'd love to hear kind of where you guys are at. And, you know, as we go through the exercises, just as much input as possible from all of you. Um, I know this entire group is all about collaborating, which is amazing. And I think the more we get inspired from each other's ideas, the better we're going going to be able to put a really solid plan together for our own businesses. You know, each idea, it doesn't matter, you know, who has it first, everybody initiates on it differently. And I think it's really important to remember. So just because one person takes an idea of you know, that you were using, they're going to use, put their own spin on it and make the most of it with their own audience. So the more sharing we can do, the better, I think we're all going to be um, at the end of this. Absolutely. Um, It reminds me of a quote. 
I don't, I don't say that much, but there's something that an old boss of mine used to say, which is there's no monopoly on good ideas, which mm. just means what you just said, but I wanted to put it into a sentence he quote kind of thing there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there really, this, this is only as good as what we all put into it. We're going to present you with a bunch of information. Um, and really this is about giving you a template and a direction in how to look at things going into the year ahead and beyond. Um, but that's really what uh, this is going to come down to. The day that we go through today is a little bit more framework, a little bit more getting a, um, a specific view of what it is that you are looking for, what your goals are, really isolating those things and taking a deep dive into some of the strategies that can be used to further what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, for yourself and your business. Uh, but then uh, tomorrow, we're going to then implement a lot of what comes out of today and show you how to actually put those things into action. A little bit of a financial piece of it tomorrow as well to help keep track of the dollars and cents, which is super important. And so, like we said, this is scheduled for two hours. That is in a lot of ways predicated on how much or how little the people here are going to participate and interact with us. Um, if it's just Katie and I talking, those of you who have listened to us before know we could talk for two hours, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> so um, we're going to uh, make sure that there's some time put aside for you guys to ask questions, to do some work on this stuff as well. And uh, that last point there, just remember everybody here, everybody who's listening to this after the fact, we're all at different stages in our career. We're all at different stages in our lives. Different things are important to us that might not be important to somebody else. And that means that what these plans and what comes out of this is going to look like is going to be completely different from person to person. And that's how it should be. This should be um, a process that's unique to you. And again, just a framework that helps you put into action the things that are gonna get you to where your goals are at and ultimately unbreak your business. Right. All right. Why not open with a quote? I already quote. dropped wow. one. <laughs> the best way to predict your future is to create it. And, you know, this is, this is super important um, to put the time into creating a solid plan for yourself for 2023. I think a lot of us, uh, myself included, go into our year with a lot of great intentions, but when it's not written down and it's not, um, you know, th thought through in a way that could really work for you for this next year, it's really hard to stick to something, stick to something that's going to keep you focused through the entire year. So this is the time now we've, you know, you guys have dedicated the next couple of hours to doing this and then tomorrow as well. Even if you were just to like work through this with us over this next two days, you're going to be so much further ahead than a lot of people um, just to get ready for your year and just getting you excited and, and getting you into that momentum that we need to be at this point um, to start January off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that this is not going to feel the same as I, we've seen, you see, I, I mean, I get five emails a day about planning sessions that are happening out there and they're probably all really good in their own way and they all achieve different things. This is not built to be a standardized, here's what you need to do plan other than allowing you to create something that works for you and to understand what you want in your future. So with that, we're jumping right in. This is all you. Well, I mean, I could, I could jump in, but. Yeah. So I'm, um, I, I think everybody got the annual plan. I don't know if anybody joined after I, I had sent it. So let me just. So. Yeah. Put a it... few people have been coming in here and there. Okay. Yeah. So I put it in the chat again. I, um, so as I, as we said before, take this um, print it out if you can, but if you don't have a printer, you're not able to do that quickly, get a pen and paper and let's start work diving into this. So the first thing that we like to start off with is just creating a life list for yourself. I think we are, you know, obviously real estate is something that's a big part of our lives, but ultimately there's a lot more that's a part that's in our lives. And that's really important. And the reason why we do real estate really um, 
is, is connecting back to the things that we want to do in our lives with our family, the adventures we want to go on, all of that kind of stuff. Um, oh, can't see the PDF in the chat. It's coming out as an attachment. I'm not sure if anybody else is having trouble getting it. I'll just put it back in again. Yeah, anybody who came sent, in the last couple of minutes might not see it in the history. Should be there. If anybody can just say that they can see it in there, that would be great. Yeah, you might have to hover over it and then it'll pop up, click to download or click to open. I see Okay, it. you just see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so yeah, the, the life list is ultimately what, you know, creates your purpose behind the goals that you want for your career in real estate. And, and that obviously helps you to push you forward in those times where it's really difficult to keep going to ask, you know, you probably ask yourself many times through the years that you're doing real estate, like, why am I doing this? Why am I, um, why am I working on my videos? Like, what is the purpose for this? And ultimately, if you can connect it back to something that's a, a greater, purpose in your life, it really makes a big difference and really gets you through those more challenging times. So we really want to brainstorm all of the exciting accomplishments that you want in your life and breaking them down. So we want to look at a few different things. Number one is what are the things that you want to do in your life? Um, so we have some examples here, but if anybody wants to hop on the chat and maybe let us know what are some things that you want to do or come off of mute. Um, but some examples, you know, like family trips or just big, you know, big bucket list trips, um, or something that to think about, um, maybe some adventure stuff, like jumping out of an airplane, um, coming back to real estate, like, where do you see your career going? There's so many different avenues that you can take ultimately. Um, if you're a solo agent right now, maybe you want to build a big high performing team that works in a specific area. Um, fund being able to be an actor and writer. Somebody just wrote in the chat, which is awesome. Travel to as many places as possible. I love it. Um, so you guys have some, some really big dreams, which is awesome. And this is where we want to talk about them. And, and this is meant to be for those of you who have heard of, or have a vision board, this is kind of the, the, personification is the wrong word, but this is kind of the on paper version of what that is breaking it down. And the to-do element of it is the tangible achievements you want to achieve. And that doesn't just mean achievement in this traditional awards and things like that, but this is the stuff. I look at this whole thing as the, when you look back on your life years mm -hmm. and years from now, what are all the things you want to be able to say, I did that and, you know, and I left nothing on the table. Like I did the things I wanted to do. Um, I'm starting to think now, as we go through this presentation, like we didn't make this presentation where we reveal things like point by point. So I know all of you are reading ahead already, which is fine. But, okay. um, but yeah, so that's, that's the to do. And uh, again, I can't see the chat, so I apologize, but I don't know. If people yeah, no, there's some really great to do's here um, that that are coming out here. So uh, a rock star mother, be able to support a family, um, keep paying for my son's private school. Yeah, I bet that's a big one for sure. Um, so there's so many different ones, which is amazing. So it's not just like, you know, common things that people want to do. It's like everybody's got their own life. And, and this definitely goes back to the whole annual planning theme that we want to put forward is that everybody's going to have different reasons for doing this. Everybody's going to have a different focus ultimately when you want to build your business. And that's, what's so great about this career. So, um, that's awesome to do. Um, the next is to have, and this might be an area where you can get a little, um, I don't know, just, you know, think, think Throw for yourself, it out there. You throw it be, out there. Yeah. You can be the selfish dickhead. Now that's what we want. That's what we want. You <laughs> I was to be. trying to think of a nicer way to put that. No, but, no. Okay. Let's, let's, let's call <laughs> let's it what it selfish is. Selfish dickheads. <laughs> this is where you get to say, here's what I want. Okay. This whole page is what I want, but the, the have, this is yeah. the tangible. This is the shallow. I don't care what you want to call it. What do you want? What do yeah. you want? And it's not all just you know, money and cars necessarily, but nice. there's a lot of examples there as well. This, this is the stuff that you want to have, you know, like Katie said, we're doing this. Obviously there's the relationship, there's the client element to things. 
Um, that is super important. And that's why a lot of us are in this full stop, but you're also working to earn a living. You're working mm -hmm. to make money, to afford yourself the opportunity to have certain things and to do certain things. And the other ones that we haven't gotten to yet here either. So definitely jump out there and yeah. share the haves. All right. So we've got a few in the chat, uh, a helicopter, so I don't have to drive through traffic. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. I watch, uh, I don't know if anybody else watches the Kardashian speaking of shallow, <laughs> but they've got their own airline, which is just crazy to me, but yeah, I could see why that would be convenient. <laughs> um, big house with a big pool and a big backyard for my dog um, to have my own property. Uh, a farm property so I can house more dogs. It's definitely all money and cars. <laughs> um, just being able to pay mortgage in Toronto means you're rich. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, those are all great ones. I love that. I know for myself, it's, yeah, I'd love to have a bigger house with some bigger property around it. Um, that would be awesome overlooking, you know, having a kitchen that overlooks something beyond um, a brick wall. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining, <laughs> but yeah, I think we all have those, those ideas. So make a lot of money and be financially independent as a woman, get out of the culture bias. Yeah. That I just have to be a housewife. That's yeah. No, lots of, lots of good things there. Okay. So you guys have all put forward some really great to have. So, so what do you want to be um, beyond what you are right now, which is realtor, but what, what other roles do you have in your life? And maybe what roles do you want to have in your life? Um, so if you're a parent right now, or if you want to become a parent, um, something other like support other family members, um, an athlete, a leader, a real estate coach, so, you know, the sky's the limits, guys. There's lots of different things. I think somebody had mentioned before um, funding their uh, acting career. Um, so, you know, want to be an actor or a writer or something like that. Maybe you want to write a book. Um, so if anybody wants to jump into the chat to let us know what you want to be, that and, would be great. And let's remember that this is not the annual plan element. So this isn't what I want to be in the next 365 days necessarily, although that's a great goal for whatever you want to shoot for, but this is where you get the opportunity to shoot for the stars. And this is meant to purposefully pump us up about what we want out of what we're doing. We need mm -hmm. big goals because big goals are our purpose. And that's what drives us to do the work that gets us there. So mm -hmm. be bold in the stuff that you want to be. 100%. So we've got a professional shuffle dancer, <laughs> know who that is, long-term goal, uh, build wealth through real estate investing. I'm after multifamily properties. That's my goal to get there. Um, <laughs> at some point, I want to do some podcasting that I can change my name to John Rogan. <laughs> I love that. Um, get married, travel, and have kids. Uh, to be parent who adopts a kid that needs a supportive family. Oh, that's amazing. My own real estate investing company, be a wife and mom. So great. Yeah. Like a lot of, you know, giving back to whether it's in time or, you know, money, whatever that might be. I know probably a lot of us have certain causes that are near and dear to our hearts and we'd love to give back more in, the, in those ways. Um, so again, there's so many different options out there. Good segue. Yeah. To the next one. Oh. All right. Or am I muted? To or the next slide. Making sense? No, no, no. To the <laughs> to the give part. Or or oh, that's was, what I said. That's what oh, I was on. Oh, that was Sorry. it. Okay. I, th I thought you were. I thought you were transitioning from the to be to the to give, but that was okay. no. I got you. Fine. To give. We're gonna go through this. Yeah, it's true. We'll take forty five minutes on the first slide, and that would be <laughs> too much. So okay. So again, for those of you who have the PDF, this is kind of your instruction manual of the things, and we explained what it is that those all represent you are now going to have the opportunity to populate this yourself. Okay. Whether you do it now, whether you take some time uh, moving forward to do it, there is a method to this and a reason that things are done in the order they're done. We want to start with vision and we want to start with goals and purpose, because again, that drives the strategies and what it is we know we need to accomplish going forward to get there. Right. So for those of you who have, 
heard us before or are familiar with the way that we approach things, it's always about breaking down big ideas as small as we can so that things are achievable, they're understandable, and they don't seem like they're out of reach. Because when you go from, or when you think you need to go from zero to a hundred, it's impossible to get there or very difficult. I shouldn't say impossible. Nothing's impossible, but everything that you've put on your vision board, on your life list, on this sort of, on this sort of exercise is built as in some respects, a finish line you're working to understanding that there's always more. This isn't a finite end to things either, because you're going to accomplish all these things and you're going to add more in a fluid way. But this is something you should take the time to build onto as we're working. And as you look at the PDF that's been shared there that you can work on as well. And again, here's a whole bunch of examples. I just typed that. Katie just typed that <laughs> and pressed enter. <laughs> Actually, we didn't even need this. Like we were wondering know, if was... people were to come out with examples. I mean, honestly, we, we filled the list already. We're good. Um, and somebody just wrote in the chat, need an effective way to create a vision board. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in. I know for myself, what I've done is um, printed out just little pictures of what the different things represent. So in my closet right now, I've got a couple of just little small strings where I've clipped these little pictures onto. And, you know, I've got, pictures of Hawaii and like a really nice house um, and, and all those things that I want. Um, and it's an area, obviously I'm in my closet daily, so I'm, I'm constantly looking at it. And even, even our kids will go in and look at it and they, and sharing in that as well, I think is really important sharing with your close family and friends, the goals that you want for yourself. Um, it'll help, help you get the support that you, you want and help them to kind of push you along to those big goals. So I found that that like a visual representation of the goals has been a really powerful way to um, kind of see them come to life, which is really exciting too. Obviously not all of them come to life, but you know, over the years you start to see things come, come to, come to truth. And it's, it's very, very exciting. So um, I know a lot of people also will put, you know, maybe a vision board on their phone or as a screensaver on their computer or whatever that might be um, as another visual reminder. So things like that could be an option. I don't know if anybody else has anything that they do. Um, I typically go through Pinterest um, and just like maybe for a week or so and just like note pictures and save them in one like board and then I export them to Canva and like just make it look pretty and it has everything from like pictures to quotes to like things ideal things you want not just like you know the material things it can also be like joy happiness like anything just putting words out there and then like you said I make it my um desk desktop screen mm -hmm one of my screens and like every day I see it obviously people around me know about it and it's just it's just every day once I open my laptop it's just a reminder of like what I'm working towards and yeah that's awesome I love that thanks for sharing it's it's yeah. so important to have it tangibly in front of you like that's the theme is yeah you can't just keep it in your head like I think all of us have goals and visions and I I don't know. It's it's not it's not an embarrassing thing to put it out there. It's fulfilling and it helps you keep literally eyes on it in real time. And like Christiana was saying, like it's a good thing if other people can see it too. I mean, keep it personal for sure, but nothing motivates well, me. I mean, I'm a visual learner too, but nothing motivates me like having it in front of me and when other people know my goals too from an accountability perspective you know, people who care about our success are the ones who are only going to push us along, right? Nobody's going to question your goals. And that's kind of the theme to this whole thing is there's no wrong answer to what your mm -hmm. life list is, whatever it is, whether it's adjectives, just feelings you want to have or things you want to do, you know, these buckets hopefully help cover all of those things. But it's important to identify as much as you can here, like just go wild and and be excited about the things you're going to accomplish. Yeah, and then I just have one more comment in, in the chat. Um, put the ideas and picks in, in a diary. Um, and then every night when um, you write some gratitude, you revisit those and, and just another reminder. So yeah, as long as you have them, because what I find sometimes happens with an annual plan 
plan, especially, is that we write it all out and then we put it in a drawer nice and safe and then you don't look at it for the next 12 months. So it, this kind of connects obviously with your annual plan. So it's, it's that nice representation um, that, that you can have and, and it's really accessible. So mine's yeah. on my desk. Mine's right here. And it's not because <laughs> we were doing this session. Just it is right here. Perfect. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was waiting for you to knock that anyway. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, Again, I I I want to move forward. I don't know if anything else yep. is in the chat, but okay. Nope, we're good. Okay, so again, before we move forward, the most important thing is to look back deep. I know, so deep. Um, we need to take a look again, regardless of where you're at in your career. You could have been in real estate for thirty years. This could be your first year. You could be just getting started. It's important to identify how things have gone over the last year for you, whether or not you had a plan. If you did, it might be easier to evaluate how you did against your plan, if that's the, the, uh, the marker against which you're going to evaluate. But really, dive into the things that were tangible and intangible about your business over the last year. So milestones you achieved or didn't achieve is great. Um, you know, whether there's actual quantifiable things that's important, but what's most important is what were you happy with in the way you ran your business in the different things you did, um, whether it's your ability to develop your communication skills, whether it's your ability to, uh, if, if you were trying to develop leadership skills, things like that, certain approaches you took with marketing, maybe that worked well or didn't work well systems you tried to implement that worked well or didn't work well. Um, Again, I know this isn't coming in piecemeal, so you could see the three questions that are here. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if people are sharing in the chat, things like that, but definitely jump in with how things have been and how you're looking back at your year. And if you are brand new and you haven't, and you're saying, well, wait a second, I'm just starting my business. It doesn't mean that reflection is impossible, even as it relates to how you build your business going forward, right? I think it's important to identify the places in your life where things have been working well, whether it's time management, again, communication skills, your ability to build relationships in the job you were in or in the position that you were in, what were things that seemed to serve you well, things that were frustrating, things you learned from. These are all important things to reflect on because it helps shape the way you're going to build things going forward. Mm -hmm. So one comment so far, um, crap, <laughs> that's my business in 2020, so lots of closed deals, but more flops. And I think we all have felt a lot of that with the changing market, um, lots of different emotions from clients and, and helping them through some difficult conversations. So yeah, um, does anybody want to comment in terms of systems? I know that's a big one. Um, mm -hmm that I, sorry somebody just just quickly yeah um it's been really busy last few years just just a quick note like don't ever get comfortable i think a lot of mm. times we want to get to that end goal um i don't think there is an end goal i am a car guy for instance i want a ferrari a lambo blah blah, blah. i think after that i'm going to want to helicopter than a jet than a yacht it's never going to stop so i think like okay yeah we had a great year making 100k 400k whatever the case and then we kind of oh i've made it and then all of a sudden you're going to go down that literally happened to me happening to me i got too comfortable i thought i was the new ryan surhan and that was it so just a quick note don't get comfortable even if you've made a million dollars you might be negative a million the next year. So just keep going, keep going. And if you're at the bottom, like not the bottom, but if you're struggling, I feel like that's a good thing to keep you on your toes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we're looking for that comfort. Oh, I just need a hundred K in my bank and I'll be good. I don't think yeah. that's a healthy way of approaching business because this is nonstop. This is ongoing, ongoing. There's no end goal. That's at least how I see it. Definitely. That's a great perspective for sure. Yeah. It, it's, it is never ending. And in our biz, we're entrepreneurs, all of us, right? We're not counting on a regular paycheck that comes every week. 
you know, mm-hmm. we, and when we reflect, it's important Like there's a reason that the well and the not well is here. And you need to make sure you're populating both of those, right? Talking about what worked well, isn't there to make yourself feel like nothing's broken and everything's great. And, but it is important to understand that regardless of how much money you did or didn't make and how many deals you did or didn't do, you had successes in the last year, right? Like even just making it through these last two years for what they were in the world is a Mm -hmm. win for everybody, right? Um, A lot of people have been struggling in the last six months, you know, the market has been doing what it's doing. And because of that, it's very easy to look back on most of this last year and call it a failure. And in the what didn't work well, there's ways to reflect on that. Maybe a lot of us weren't built with systems that prepared us for massive change or contingency and things like that. And it's impossible to sustain a ton of business when things happen in the market that are completely out of our control. But our ability to be humble enough to identify that we're not perfect. And that like Aleem was saying that there's always more anyway, even if it was an amazing year and you're looking at it now going, holy crap, I made 3 million bucks last year and I got the Ferrari and the Lambo and you know, the down payments in on the copper on the chopper already, (laughs) which I hope for anybody in this room is the case. And we'd all like a lift. (laughs) Um, You know, even if that's the case, we can all look back and say, but we could have done better. You know, if you're a sports fan, you know, after a big win in the interviews, these athletes always say, yeah, you know, we got some stuff to work out. It was a great win. It was a great win, but we're still going to look at the tape and figure out what we did wrong. You know, this, this is the attitude that we need to have in business in our lives, but not to the detriment of celebrating our successes. And that's why they're both here as well. Right. Because if you focus on the bad you lose sight of the fact that we're all here, right? We're all, even the fact that you're showing up at a session like this means, you know, you're positive enough about yourself to know that you want to better yourself. If that Mm -hmm. makes sense, right? Like, you know, that things have, have been great, not great, whatever, but there's good, there's bad, and there can always be better. And this is part of that process to identify the stuff you can work on and leverage the things and, and build on the things that you've done well. Because we all have tons of qualities that make us unique. And that's what we need to reflect on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's so important. I think one of my words um, in the last couple of years, we always select a word for the year that we want to like kind of remind us of how we want to live, live that year. And um, one of the words that I selected a couple of years ago was celebrate, because I found that that's what I was doing. I'd, I'd get a deal done. I would do something that was like, I was working towards and it's like, okay, that's great but I'm moving on to something else. Like I never took the time to actually celebrate the wins and we really have to make sure we're doing that. So really take a look at the last year where you were at the beginning of the year and how much you've learned, what worked well. Like, have you put yourself out on video and have you finally kind of found like a groove with that and gotten more comfortable? That's a big deal. You know, there's a lot of things that are big deals that you might not see as a big deal anymore because now you've, you, you figured it out. But for a lot of people that are starting out or haven't gone through that process, it's still really difficult. So really, really give yourself some props on this, but also get, be honest with what didn't work well. Um, and just going into the chat, I know some people, somebody mentioned Facebook ads, which I feel you right there. I hate uh, Facebook ads. If someone's saying they did it well, <laughs> then we'll set up a call afterwards because that is the Seriously. bane of our existence. Facebook ads. <laughs> this will not be a seminar on Facebook ads. Yeah. Um, and then creating relationships with clients that goes beyond real estate, especially with first time home buyers, um, from one client got six converted, sorry, six converted references within half a year. That's amazing. And now building on those. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, I mean, that those are the things, those are like, you know, a lot of people, want to figure out how to build their repeat and referral business and how to really have a solid base there. And so the fact that you've managed to turn one client into six others is also a very big accomplishment, something that you should take from. And that's what the the end part is kind of about is like of what worked well, what actually furthered your business? Because I think a lot of times we do certain actions in our day-to-day that we think is 
useful, but might not necessarily actually be furthering our business, like tinkering with our website over and over and over again, or, or our listing presentation and trying to get the font exactly right, or have like the best looking business card out there, or, you know, some examples like that, where you've already got something and just kind of like, you got to keep it and move on from it. But sometimes it's hard for us. It, it's like an easy distraction from the work that we might not want to do, or we know we have to be out there talking to people, but we'd rather sit at home and work on an amazing Instagram post. Although that's important, like it's important to identify the things that, that really actually furthered your business. Well, and and it, it's interesting that it works both ways on that side too, because the examples you brought up are bang on, but even in things that are designed to further your business that may have worked well because you hit your targets on them might not have worked well to further your business because they weren't the right fit for you, right? Mm -hmm. For an example, let's yeah. say you told yourself, I need to knock on 50 doors every day or whatever, right? And you can look back and you could say, you know what? I did that. Like I said, I would, but door knocking is not your thing. And you've identified after the year is over, you got nowhere from doing it and you hated doing it. And it worked well because you hit your target, but it didn't work well as far as your business is concerned. It's important to identify those things as well, because there's a line to be drawn between accomplishing things you set out to accomplish and whether or not they led to your business mm -hmm. improving. And I'll throw some examples out here as well. I know we're talking about it as we go, but we... Yeah, no, nothing more in the chat um, other than somebody agreeing about the website <laughs> and just constantly kind of trying to, but yeah, like some, like John did mention, it's a good point. Like he just uses the brokerage provided one. I find them useless now, other than the fact that people just go to it and see that you are real. Um, and I think a lot of people, like, I mean, there's definitely people that use it for lead gen. Like, again, it depends on why you're using it and what you're using it for. But if you're not one of those people that, you know, is relying on online leads or, you know, maybe don't have that specific strategy that where a website will help support that strategy, then it's probably not something that you should be working on. So I think that's really, really important to keep in mind. Yeah, well, that, yeah, exactly. It, some of these things, we use these examples, not because they are generic things that don't work for your business. Anything could be working for your business, but you need to take a long look at what you've done and whether or not it actually moved things forward. And only you know that. And this is all up until this point, you need to be as brutally honest with yourself as you can because you're not going to improve or create the foundation to build a plan if you can't start off by being honest with yourself, mm -hmm. right? There's no one to impress here one way or another, right? This isn't about saying, no, nah, everything was awesome because I'm great and I just want to be better because yeah. unless it was, I mean, if any of you are 100% great, that's cool. <laughs> Share that in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> So a bunch of examples here. <laughs> Catherine was. <laughs> oh, she is? Okay, well, that's fair. So um, basically every, everything that we talked about, there's examples here. We won't, we won't I, I think, hang on it too much in the interest mm -hmm. of time. If anybody's not sharing anything else, we can, yeah, we can jump forward. Okay, cool. All right. This is... <laughs> This is this wasn't going to be in the presentation, but it's just too awesome not to talk about. It. And if you haven't heard us talking about it, we're talking about it again. If you have, I I'm sorry. And you're team. <laughs> this is I'm sorry and you're welcome put together. Final contextual piece before we get into the meat and potatoes of this is understanding how change works and how strategies get implemented and the shitstorm we put ourselves in. This is step one right here of the emotional cycle of change. What's the book that this is from? This comes from a lot of different places, but where was it that you introduced? This is the 12 week year, which a lot of, which is what a lot of this, is, this whole plan is based off of, but I read this in the 12 week year. Got it. Okay. So maybe we'll go back and forth on the different uh, steps here, but step one, you get an idea. You're feeling good. This is what happens whenever you want to implement something new you new marketing idea, new system, new, whatever you're excited. And this stage one is known as uninformed optimism. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You're optimistic and excited, but you're uninformed. You don't yet understand what it is that makes up this great new idea that you've got, because everything is just rainbows and sunshine. When you get a new idea, you hear an ad on the radio, 
you get retargeted for some new lead gen thing and it is the magic pill. You love life, but you're uninformed, but you're optimistic. So what happens next, Katie? Next, we go to stage two and things are going downhill uh, because we go into informed pessimism. So we finally bought the new system that's was supposed to change our lives and get us that jet that we wanted to buy quicker. And we slowly realized that the work, maybe the work that we had to put into this or the promises that were made are actually not correct. I mean, a lot of this has to do with maybe the, the goals that you can actually control. So maybe you want to create more video content on your YouTube channel and really grow your, your YouTube channel. Um, and so you go into it thinking you can, you know, post a video a day. What's, what's so hard about that? Not a big deal. Um, but slowly you realize that posting a video a day is a lot of damn work and you probably aren't going to have time to do anything else in your life. So <laughs> you start right. to really pull away from that whole goal and like ask yourself, why, why would you have even thought about this in the first place? So a lot of doubts starting to surround yourself. Yeah. Real, real life catches up with you. You realize you have kids, you realize you need special equipment. You don't know how to, whatever it is. And where does that lead to now? And, and I actually found there's other versions of this. This particular stage is also known in some, in some areas as Mount Stupid. I don't know if you've seen that one, Mount Stupid. So you climb Mount Stupid and then we roll down Mount Stupid and we end up in the Valley of Despair. Wah, wah. How dark is that? And most of you have probably heard of this before, but if you haven't, I, everyone always gets a kick out of the Valley of Despair because it is what it sounds like. You are just in the dumps. You hate everything. You're a loser. You suck. You hate your ideas. Why did you ever do this in the first place? Why isn't this working for me? I am just ready to give up. <laughs> I could go on forever. You, we, We've all been there. So this is not like a if you're if you're there kind of thinking it's you but saying like no it's not that's not me th this is everybody this is everybody who gets a new idea goes through this at some point in time and you're confronted with a choice here this is where you get the choice you can either which is what a lot of people do quit and go back to stage 1 this is me, you're me, in me. me 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 this is and don't be afraid to to admit it like this is where you're giving up on an idea or you're about to, and a new idea comes up. Something else catches your interest that sounds like the magic pill you should have taken in the first place. And you say, amazing, it's rescuing me from this hell I'm in. Take me out of the valley, bring me back up to the top of Mount Stupid. That's what a lot of people do. I wanna be an uninformed optimist again. <laughs> I wanna be an uninformed optimist because you don't know that there's anything beyond this. Right now, for a lot of people, this is a wall. This is just a brick wall that you've rolled down a hill and hit face first. You've spent money, you've wasted time, nothing's happening, everything sucks. That's where you're at right now. So it's easy, easier to take whatever the solution is that takes you out of your strategy and go back to step one with something else. However, there's an arrow going this way. Where does that go? We're going up, friends. <laughs> We're going up. And it's not Mount Stupid over here. This is a different mountain yeah. up here. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, if you can get through that valley of despair, if you can keep pushing along, like I like one great example also is just the whole um, especially when you're starting out your business, but even if you're trying to like grow your business or you find things have slowed down and you start reaching out to new people, having, you know, five conversations a day, which is a great thing to implement in your business, but you're into week two and you're getting nothing, you know, no responses to your emails. People are not responding to your phone calls or they're being super awkward and don't want to talk to you because they think you're trying to sell them something. And you're just like getting nowhere. You feel like damn it. Like I'm trying, I'm putting myself out there. I keep doing the thing and I'm not getting anywhere. And that's where most of us hit with the Valley of despair. So we're like, screw this. I'm going to buy online leads. I'm going to spend $5,000 a month and let the people come to me. And then you go down. Okay. We know how, we're, how this all goes, but <laughs> if take you're them out week, of the Valley, take them out week two and you go to week three and week four and beyond, you're going to get into the informed optimism where you start seeing slowly people 
responding positively to you. If somebody says, hey, yeah, I'm looking in the next year to buy an investment property. Can you help me with that? My parents are actually looking to sell next week. Can you go over there and have a chat with them? You're going to start to get little hints over time that, listen, all that work I've put into things is actually going to amount to the the business that I want for myself. And so you have to keep pushing as long as your idea is a good one. And I think most of us here have great ideas. As long as you're staying consistent with it, you're going to get out of that valley of despair quick, quicker than you probably would have if you would have been, if you're not so negative <laughs> and get into that informed optimism where you look back and you're like, damn, that was a lot of work but I put in the work and now I'm starting to see the results. And we all know that the results aren't going to happen within a couple of weeks, unfortunately. And, and this can be put, this literally can be attached to any strategy. You can probably think of strategies you're doing right now or not doing where like take social media as an example, people get upset when they put up a couple of things and nobody likes them or nobody follows them or nobody this or nobody that. But the more you do and the more consistent you are, the more literally you're shown to more people and the more it gives you the opportunity to get out there and see more people and build a consistency. And the nice thing is this is not just a line that keeps going up that continues to make you kind of reinvent what you're doing and keep at it. This is actually something that allows you to get to cruise control. When you get through pushing through, you're always going to be doing the work, but you systemize what it is that you're doing in such a way that you now have a successful strategy that's implemented, working, you know what to do, and it creates part of your strategy in a way that's automatic, which is part of the goal out of planning altogether is having strategies that in a lot of ways are automated, that when you wake up in the morning, you don't have every minute planned out, but you have a piece of your day blocked where you understand what you need to do to be successful, right? So that's the point of this. And the goal is to be on the right side of this curve moving up. Like Katie said, there will be strategies that don't work, okay? We once bought elevator ads in a condo building um, because we thought it was a great idea. We were targeting the, the condo but we didn't do the research to realize that there were five other realtors in the rotation of videos in this elevator that we had one ad that would show up once an hour for 30 seconds among other realtors who had already farmed and hit the building. And it wasn't really our, it was just a gong show. And when it came time to renew, this strategy would say, no, 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 renew it because you haven't given it a chance. But sometimes you still need to be able to evaluate what you're doing and determine where you might not be employing the right strategy. But um, in other cases, in most cases, you need to push through. And this is also where everything in here should be dealt with in such a way where you're not doing any of this alone. You need to have people around you to bounce ideas off of, to evaluate things, to help you um, stay accountable. And so I'm going to go to the next slide and I'm going to be back in a second because it apparently there's someone waiting for me. Um, and just going back to the elevator oh, ad or, thing, or no, 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 you can, that. you can go to the next slide. Sorry. I just wanted to also mention okay. that the reason why that didn't work for us is because we didn't have a, like a, a specific focus on those buildings outside of just the random ads that we were putting out there. So again, if you've got like a, a full strategy that incorporates different ways of reaching people, it, it will become a more solid focus plan versus, you know, these random choices we make to, to put ourselves out there and get our advertising out there. So we are going to the next slide here. Um, this is just the next part of really breaking the numbers down for yourself and understanding what you need to do in terms of deals to get you to where you want to go. And ultimately, the profit goal, and we say profit, not GCI, which we'll get into a little bit, but the profit goal is what's going to drive you to get to that next level, to put in place a solid plan. So this is like basically the, the main goal that you want for yourself for 2023. And what does that profit goal, what is that profit goal? You want to choose something that is going to stretch you 
um, which is really important, but you also want to choose something that's going to be attainable. I speak with a lot of agents and, and a lot of times they want to go into this saying, okay, I've made maybe a hundred thousand dollars the last three years. And it's been very consistent, but this year I want to do 500,000. And, and while I don't want to dash anybody's dreams, I also want to be realistic with everybody to let like to try to encourage you to do something that's a stretch goal, but also not to screw yourselves over and realize halfway through the year that you're not going to get to the goal that you wanted for yourself. So that's, that's a really important thing to keep in mind as you kind of consider what you want to select as your profit goal. And the reason why we say profit is because we are all running a business here and we are all entrepreneurs and we've got expenses and we need to account for those. We need to be very smart about how we're spending our money. And especially when it comes to the listing side of things, I think a lot of us have seen that, you know, when we hired a stager back in February and the house sold in seven days, that was not a concern to me. But now if my house, if my listing's sitting on the market for 30 plus days and I have to renew the staging, I have to keep putting out ads to try to generate some interest in this home those costs are, are hitting my profit. And we have to think about it in terms of profit because ultimately if you're if you're if you're making a million dollars in GCI but you're putting you know nine hundred thousand into your expenses at the end of the day you're you're not going to be making much. So it wouldn't it doesn't really matter that you're making a million dollars in GCI. So again um, we're gonna Daniel will kind of explain the whole way to think about this in terms of the profit part of this but um, keep obviously the number will be lower because we're talking about profit and not GCI. Cool. I, I see there's a couple of things in the chat, but I still can't read them. I don't know if there's a question there before I jump in. Uh, no, just, uh, just asking if the PDF is editable. Um, it looks like you can, maybe you can mark it up depending if you have a specific type of PDF something. <laughs> um, but yeah, you probably just have to print it, print it out. <laughs> or if you want to go into like, you know, authenticide and something and put in some boxes some text boxes and write it's, it out on it's, there. It's that so funny too. how much I've been doing that now, instead of just printing something and writing on it, which is probably easier, but yeah, yeah. we've got, it depends so on how you learn too. Like I find writing I it down true. is helpful. Yeah. But uh, yeah, sorry, it's not editable, but yeah, at least, yeah. Unless you've got some something, some trick, maybe if somebody wants to give us a hack, then we could put that in the chat too. That'll go into our unbreak your business, business planning session. What worked well, what didn't. <laughs> um, okay. So we're talking a bit about, I, I guess we're up to defining profit here, which you, which you touched on there. But uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to be diving deep into finances and really identifying how much money you are or aren't making and want to make tomorrow. Um, so we will get into the real number stuff later on, but what's important to do now, which I think Katie was touching on is be conservative. You want to be um, not complacent and, and give yourself really like softball, easy targets. Cause that's no fun. But at the same time, don't overstate what your market actually gives to you and don't jump too exponentially from what you've been used to doing in the past either. Um, like we talked about, this has been for a lot of people an off year. And so it is important to jump maybe more than you would normally in a, in a, in a, in a quote unquote regular year, year over year in what you want to make for yourself. Um, but when you're talking about reasonable goals, it's not just reasonable in terms of the amount of revenue you're bringing in, but be reasonable in the amount of spend you're going to have to put out there to generate this business. Um, now, there's easier ways to determine your average spend. There are usually uh, pretty standard fixed costs that a lot of us attach to a listing, whether it's staging costs, whether it's photography, um, things like that that you can typically quantify, whether it's on a percentage basis or whether it's a static amount, you're always paying your people to do things. That's easier. There is a bit more of a moving target depending on your business model in terms of how much overhead you pay for yourself in a year, um, such as marketing, the things that aren't directly attributable necessarily to a deal. And you want to be able to identify those business costs here too, on average, because 
ultimately that's money you're spending this year for your business. Don't worry about other costs in your life that aren't related to your business. Definitely there's expenses you need to pay for, whether it's daycare, whether it's you know gas, groceries, things like that. That's not what we're considering here. What we want to establish here is the profit that you're going to take out of your real estate business specifically. And I don't know if you touched already on, on the purpose part here. I think, did you leave off at the goal or you talked a bit about the purpose? Yeah. No, I didn't. I just, yeah. That was all. I, I mean, I won't dwell into this. This ties back potentially to a piece of your life list that we talked about before. But when we've established what your goal is for the year, what does that mean for you? And it's typically more than just, I'm going to, you know, be able to have a steak dinner once a month. Like it might mean my kids are going to be able to be in the programs that they've wanted to be in, or I'm able to take care of a sick parent. Um, you know, it might not be family related, but it's a larger purpose for which you're doing this job because the profit is the money that's left over. And a lot of it may go towards your living expenses that you need that are outside of business, but it's really helpful to help you stay accountable to your goals when you're focused on something that goes beyond just survival, right? I think that's an important, it is an important goal. Obviously you want to make sure that your bills are paid and that is the initial, here's why I want to make the money. Um, but make sure that you've got in there, uh, you know, a purpose and a goal that's ensuring that it keeps you motivated to keep going, whatever that is. It's the thing that you can look at when you're down in the dumps or you're wallowing in the valley of despair. And at some point you say, why am I doing this? Or how can I keep going? That's what this line is all about, right? This coupled with the rest of your strategy, but at a very micro level, this is what that's about. And so from there, going back to dollars and cents, we now take it into a little bit more of a granular approach to what the numbers are going to look like. Um, we're going to split it into what would your average, so commission being revenue, what would your average GCI be on a listing, a purchase, and a lease? And pretty much all these numbers can come from what you populated up at the top of the page here. If you know that the average listing commission in your area is 2%, let's say, and the average sale price in your area is a million dollars, then the average listing commission is going to be 20,000, right? It might help go to the next slide, um, just because it sure. is an actual example. Look yeah, that. that might be easier. To I should have done understand. it with a snap to make it look more impressive. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so let's use these examples. Um, Average sale price in your area is $1.2 million, let's say, and the average listing commission is 2%. That means on average, you're pulling in $24,000 on a listing. And if anybody has any questions, just jump in the chat, post them there, and I, I can jump into more detail. Your average spend, and you could see it says here, including your fees and splits, your marketing costs, gifts, et cetera. Um, this could be all the stuff that I was talking about before, but on average for a listing, this will usually be... 80% plus the stuff specific to a listing, but wherever you can try to take any of those overall overhead amounts and attribute them on a per listing basis. So for example, if you're going to, and, and this is kind of going back and forth, you can see here, six listings and four purchases is what was an example here. If you know you're going to be aiming for 10 to 12 transactions in a year, like non-lease transactions, you might want to attribute if you've got $12,000 in marketing costs overall for your business, you might want to say a thousand per transaction is roughly what you're allocating. And that would fall in here as an average spend. This is all estimates. Okay. This isn't the letter of the law that you need to, need to, need to stay below or, or stay above on the revenue side to make this work. What this is doing, just to understand the point of this step, it's to put into context what you need to do at a high level to get where you want to go over the course of the year. Okay. This is all stuff that we're going to aim to outdo, but it's a target that we can focus on that's tangible and also allows us in real time to measure against where we're at to what we thought we were going to be at so that we can help going forward, even identify areas where we can improve or where we might've been off with our estimates as well. I see more things in the chat there, but I don't know if they're questions. Sorry. 
Yeah, no, um, Laura's actually giving some uh, a hack on how to mark it up as a PDF if you have uh, oh. an Apple. So that's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Laura. Awesome. Um, okay, so listings generally are going to have more costs associated with them. You are taking on most of the marketing. You're doing all the prep work for it. When it comes to purchasing, there are still costs that come with that. It might be things like, obviously, your split that will come out of it. Maybe you want to allocate a certain amount of travel time, gas, things like that, a gift that you may be getting purchasers when a purchase is over. Uh, but again, the process is the same. Your average commission is based on here. On average, let's say 2.25 is what's paid for the co-op broker in your area. The average sale price is 1.2. Um, and if you're farming two different areas, you know you make this work for you. This is just an example. That would work out to 27000 on average. The spend might be a little bit less. Your average profit for a purchase is much higher in this particular scenario. And then leases, same idea. If the average lease commission is half month rent, let's say this is your brokerage split, deal fees, things like that, all this stuff needs to be identified and put into here just on a per transaction basis. And from that, again, you need to balance being real with what you have done, what your focus is as a business, and what makes sense to reasonably get you to the goal that you set for yourself. This might be a wake up call for some of you. If you've only been taking in, you know, $15,000 a year in prior years, and now you're saying you want to make 200,000, it's going to potentially a be an unreasonable jump based on the market and based on where you're at and building your business. But it also is going to put into perspective with these numbers, how many deals do you actually need to do based on these figures to get where it is you say you want to go, right? And this is where you get to start to consider what is the mix that you've been working with? Because looking back on the past year is the best way to gauge where you want to be going forward, right? If you know that this past year, you were 100% leases, and you know you want to start transitioning into working with buyers and sellers, it doesn't mean you change your goal here to say, I just want to do five buys and five, five listings and zero leases next year, right? It's unreasonable. It doesn't fit into the trajectory that you're moving, but it might be reasonable to say, okay, I did 50 leases this year. That was a great way to build my pipeline. And I think I'm going to be able to pull some business out of that. And with the strategies I put into place, I'll be able to pull some business out of that. Maybe I only want to do 15 leases this year. And I want to aim to do two listings and two purchases this year, right? And look at what those numbers look like and start to work with it. So that's what was done here. You can see that uh, a model was created here from this particular example where, okay, if I do six listings on average at the 17,000, it would be 102,000 in profit, four purchases, 92,000, five leases, 6,300. That gets me where I want to be. So it's 15 transactions over the course of the year split to being five leases, six listings, and four purchases. On average, if all things remain the way that you know are predicted, and they won't, not to the dollar, not to the number of transactions, that gets me where I want to go. And it sets a clear, tangible goal to estimate mm -hmm. for myself moving forward as I build the rest of my strategy. And it's really helpful, like from a transaction perspective to know where you're at. Um, like sometimes the numbers can be overwhelming or like, you know, how much more do I have to go to hit that profit goal? But if you know how many transactions you need to complete, um, it just makes it that much easier and an easier thing to, to work towards. And, and sometimes it might surprise you, like maybe you thought 200,000 in profit would require 30 transactions. And really it, it, it's not as much as you might've thought. Um, so after you go through this exercise, you may go back and maybe adjust that profit goal for yourself. Um, obviously staying reasonable, maybe, but maybe you have to adjust it up or down based on what kind of comes out of this whole calculation piece. Yeah. And, and it's obviously very different for everybody, not just with what your goal is, but with what your market is, what your, your trading area could be defined a lot of different ways, right? Not all of us are working a particular farmed community. So there might be a lot of variables that go into what an, a quote unquote average transaction is, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you might deal part of the time in resale condos and part of the time in resale detached homes, which could vary by a million dollars, right? So you've got to take all that into consideration and build out your model in a way that makes sense for what you plan to do. However, as we're going to talk about staying focused and not just casting a net, like I can tell you there's going to be a lot of different strategies that come out of this session that are unique to you. The only strategy that will not come out of this, if you do this right, is I just want to talk to everybody using every mechanism available to me and see how much business I get. That's not the goal of this, right? It's not throwing a million things against the wall and seeing what sticks. And anybody who calls me is a good call, right? I understand when your phone rings, you're going to pick it up. And this is, this also isn't going to be a hang up on people who don't fit your strategy, strategy, but the goal of everything that we're talking about is building a very clear path for yourself. So you know what to do and you know how to measure it as you go forward over the course of the year. So any questions on this? I know this is a big, giant slide that's big filled and with giant. lots of stuff. But honestly, once you start working through it, it, it becomes a lot clearer. So if anybody wants to jump in with any questions, we can hold off for a couple of minutes. I know that's a lot of stuff to take in. And you know what? I think we'll, we'll hang here, but maybe we'll pause for five. I know we're past the halfway point anyway. Maybe take like a five minute. Mm -hmm. break if yeah. anybody wants to run off to do your things <laughs> get it back to <laughs> um yeah. if that works unless everyone wants to power through i can't really take a vote with the number of people who are here but i suspect five minutes might be in order to just yeah why don't we come back at 11 15 um and we can finish up there's not a lot left to go but again maybe it'll help you to put together collect some questions that you might have for us at the end um, as, as we said, we'll hang out afterwards and just kind of answer things if you need. So um, And we're back. Or were you already back? Okay. Yeah, I've been back. Sorry. I'm waiting. Um, yeah, I was just kind of going through the chat. Just want to make sure everybody can hear us, hopefully. Um, Aline said small daily goals were turned into big results, which is very, very true. Um, and Catherine, Catherine was brave enough to put out her goals, which I think is awesome, 50 to 70. And I think that's a reasonable jump from 15. We're confident you can get there, Catherine. I think that's a really good, good stretch goal for you. So yeah, awesome. So it doesn't seem like anybody has any further questions on this. Um, obviously, this isn't something that you can do in a five minute break, <laughs> but definitely um, if, if you guys can work through this, it, it it doesn't, it won't take five minutes, but it won't take three hours either. Like this is something that if you were to put aside 30, 45 minutes, you could probably sit down and get, get through this if it's uninterrupted time and your kids aren't, you know interrupting you and asking you questions if you can actually just put some really good thought into it or involve your kids make it a family fun night of goal setting and budgetary planning and math yeah math, maybe yeah. they can help you actually it's true one of our kids would really benefit from a couple of these things maybe we will anyway okay moving on all right who are you who are you all right so we are going to talk I don't know why I paused there. We are going to talk a bit now about determining. We know what you want. We know what the goals are. Now we need to actually figure out what kind of an agent, realtor, person are you? And we're going to touch on the four types of agent archetypes. Fancy word. And let's just go through these one by one. Now, you may fit into more than one of these, but again, this is an opportunity where the more honest with yourself you can be about where you truly fit in the way you run your business and the way that you enjoy doing work is going to be the most helpful in helping to determine and put together your strategy going forward. Because like we've talked about before, a strategy is not, it's not effective if it's not enjoyable for you. Like work is work. Not everybody wakes up every morning, like just bouncing out of bed going, I can't wait to call people and sell homes. And I love all things real estate. However, 
it's a lot easier when you've got a strategy that matches the type of person you are and is loaded with things that you enjoy doing versus the chore element of, oh shit, I got to do this again and I can't stand this and it's so not me, blah, 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 right? Which a lot of us get, um, I think when you get into the business, especially when we're at, not to knock brokerages, but a lot of training programs and a lot of initial things at brokerages talk about the way you're supposed to do things. And that's not necessarily the way you should strategize for yourself because we're all different. So these are the four buckets that you will fall into one or a couple of these very closely. The first one is a networker. Um, and it breaks it down here. A networker is someone who enjoys being around people, loves to meet new people, um, really enjoys conversation, um, getting to know more. So it's not just about talking at people, but someone who likes to listen, to learn about people. Conversations are easy. Uh, and really the, you kind of get the impression, you get the idea here, the kind of person who likes to go to a conference. And when you go there, you're not the one I, I used to work with somebody who every time he was at a conference, he'd call me and he'd say, I'm standing beside a pole and I'm just trying to look busy. So I don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> and that was his thing. That would not be a networker. Right. But when you're in your element around people, that is what the idea of a networker is. So think about that. Um, on to yeah. the next one. Yeah. Um, so prospector, um, I'd say is more of a traditional salesperson type role where you're, you know, you love the thrill of the hunt. Um, you like reaching out to new people. You usually either through maybe door knocking or cold calling, um, but just finding new people to talk to. You like to be your, your self-starter um, and you think quick on your feet. Um, obviously, when you're talking to new people, you're getting all sorts of different types of objections and different things coming at you. So knowing how to handle those properly like this is, is, can be the difference between getting a client and not. Um, and you're a problem solver. So I think those people that love going out, hitting the pavement, knocking on doors, kissing babies, <laughs> that's more of a networker, actually. <laughs> how how many people here like kissing babies? <laughs> we all do. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's that's a prospector. <laughs> yes. And uh, moving off of the baby kissers into... <laughs> A converter, now this is more of, and these last two are more of kind of the new wave of what realtors are as technology takes takes over. So networkers and prospectors were almost the entirety of what real estate was leading up to, let's say, I don't know, the 90s or 2000s. Um, but a converter is where you want the leads to come to you, basically. You're someone who is happy to work a lead when it's warm but you're not into going out there and prospecting for new business. You want to be able to, whether it's leveraging lead gen software, whether it's leveraging things like lead or landing pages, um, ads that are churning things to you. You like to make use of tools that are out there right now that help give you at least a foot in the door. And then the conversion element is where you're in your element. So stepping into a somewhat warm conversation is what works for you. And getting people from the fence to the sale is what you do, not so much convincing them that they want to look at real estate and things like that. So that's the idea of a converter. It's definitely tech-based. It's definitely making use of all the tools that are out there now. Marketer, um, obviously somebody that enjoys uh, putting, creating more of a personal brand, social media, making use of that, being really creative, whether it's with their, maybe their listing videos or the way they put together a buyer or listing presentation. Um, they obviously the new ideas are a big thing. And then um, usually like to be on video um, and putting themselves out there in that way. I would say, I would say there's a danger with marketers. And I say that as I, speak from a, a marketer, I, I would say perspective is you can get caught up in the creativity really quickly and end up not actually doing business generating activities um, because you enjoy the process of creating so much. So that's just one warning from all my fellow marketers out there that you just want to be careful with the types of activities you are doing day to day, um, just to make sure that it is business generating work um, that is the majority of your time in your days. So 
Um, yeah, I would love for you guys to put in the chat what you guys think, see you, you yourselves as. Um, and again, as Daniel said, it could be a mix of two. I, I think that's most of us could probably connect with two of these um, types of people. Yeah. And, and as people are putting things in the chat, just a few things to note. Number one, obviously, there's no better or worse here. These all have the e equivalent ability to be successful or unsuccessful when leveraged properly or improperly. Mm -hmm. um, and just like Katie said with marketer, marketer, there's pitfalls to all of these as well, which we can dive into as we talk or, or you know, down the road. You know, uh, the benefit that each of these brings you also comes with risks that can get you caught into traps. You know, a networker, if you're just a lifelong conference goer who just loves to be around people but never actually mm. translates that into business, you know, sure, yeah. you're a networker, but in the sense of actually furthering things, it might not be serving you well. Um, and And finally, you might be thinking right now, you know what, I might be a prospector now, but my interest lies in being a marketer, right? Or what really excites me is the idea of having leads that I can convert. Go with that, okay? This doesn't mean you need to feel like you've been labeled as what you feel you've been if it's been making you miserable and you don't enjoy it, right? Things can be learned, things can be taught, you know, if you don't feel like you're strong as a marketer right now, but you really want to get into those things and that's what's going to make you excited, that's fine. But you need to understand that by identifying the type of person you are and want to be, it's going to shape what your strategy is. Obviously, this is a precursor to the things that we're putting into place. Yeah, so some good comments in the chat. Um, so we've got some marketers, 100% networker. Uh, converter and marketer mix, uh, network and converter. Um, Natty made a good point as well. It's possible to be good at something, but not actually enjoy doing it. So that's something to kind of reflect on, I think, um, and maybe keep in mind for when you're putting together your goals. Um, I'm one of those who would stand beside a pole looking at my phone to look busy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like that too, especially when I don't, like when I know people, I'm fine. But the moment you put me in a room with people I don't know, I am the worst. I'm so awkward. Um, I feel like networker prospector, but a bit of marketer is interesting to me as well. So that's great. Everybody's got like a bit of, you know, a bit I of a mix. Like there's, there's teams we could build here that we've got. And, and you can see that, yeah. like, like you said, all the bases are covered. So meet up mm -hmm. afterwards. You can all compliment each other. And it's funny, like the people that I do know in this group, when they say who they are, I, I definitely see that. So it's good to know what you are. Like, it's good to know that you guys know what you are and you're so confident in that. So that's, that's really good. And if you don't, you'll figure it out. Like you kind of have to go through the motions and try things out, especially when you're trying out, like getting into this business for the first time, you're not going to know. So you're going to try things out. And this is probably going to be a year for you where it's a lot of trial and error, which is totally fine because if at the end of the year, you now know what you are, you can create a better solid plan for yourself for the following year. So you kind of have to go through those motions. Yeah. And two, two more strategies to be able to identify it. If you're having, if you're struggling, one is talk to people that know you talk to people around you, ask what they think. If you're, if you're confused, you know, sometimes people might think you're not what you thought you were. Doesn't mean that's what you are, but it's helpful to get feedback. And it's also useful to identify what you know, you're not also. So if it's easier to work backwards and say, well, I know I'm not a prospector. Like for me, I know I'm not a prospector. Mm -hmm. I am just not excited about that. Lots of people are, and it's great, but by identifying that and eliminating it, okay, now we've got three. What resonates the most with me? What is it that I find is the most like me or the couple of things? So that is identifying who you are. Now let's talk about who we're talking to. So the two pieces that make up a deal are you and the person across the table from you, right? And we've now established what you want to get out of the business, long-term, short-term, this year, financially, what it's going to take, and the kind of person you are. Now we need to know who you're going after. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of examples here of the types of audiences that you might be going after. And it can take a lot of different faces in terms of who it is that you're after. It doesn't necessarily mean 
um, a certain demographic, which is, I think most people kind of jump to one of those things. It's either a type of demographic or a certain area, which definitely are probably the two most common types of audiences you might focus on. And they're definitely a right answer if that's what you're focused on, but there might be other types that you're focused on. You could see your client types. Maybe you want to have your key audience as first time home buyers. Maybe it's new Canadians. Maybe it's investors. Maybe you're in the commercial or a different sector that you're focused on. Um, niching this out is very helpful. And the more specific you can be in all of these elements of a strategy, the more specific your strategy can be, obviously, because then you're able to focus on something that's targeted and serves the purpose that you've been focused on. Um, and so you want to then ask yourself, these two questions. What types of audiences do I best connect with? And why do these audiences connect with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I can go through like just a quick example, just from, you know, thinking about my own business, I connect really well with first time home buyers, like young couples that are looking to get into their first home. Um, and a nice spinoff from that recently has been their parents have started reaching out to me to help sell their homes or work with them. And although, and when I look at this question, what types of audiences do I best connect with? It's definitely that younger couple demographic, because when I start working with the parents, I tend to like, it, it, there's not an immediate connection and I'm not able to be myself as much, but it's a nice spinoff of the people I work with. So I'm not going to say, oh, sorry, I can't work, work with your parents because I can't really connect with them. Like, obviously I can figure out a way to connect with them. It's just, I'm more naturally connecting with um, those younger buyers. So um, this doesn't, don't feel like you need to be pigeonholed into one way of, or one type of audience. Like it's just, you want to, figure out how you want to frame your messaging in order to connect with a certain type of person. But that doesn't mean you can't work with other types of people through your career um, as, as, they, as they come about. But you really have to have a focus on the types of marketing and the messaging that you're putting out there. And so it's important to identify who, who you best connect with and why. Why do you best connect with them? Like for me, I think I have more confidence because they are younger than me. I feel like I've got the experience to properly guide them through that transaction. I've worked with so many of them. So I know the common questions that I will get from them. Whereas with the parents, a lot of times um, I kind of feel like I'm not like my own inner, you know, voice is telling me, oh, well, they might know more than me, or maybe they don't think I have as much of authority in this space because they've they've done a million transactions before who knows what it is, but like, you know, it's just the way you react to certain types of people and, and why I think asking yourself why you connect with those audiences is also really important. Yeah. I mean, um, I'll, I'll, Oh, sorry. We're going, I was just going to say something in the chat, but yeah. Oh, no, what, what's in the chat? That's more important than what I have to say. What's <laughs> um, so what's the best way to figure out my, what my ideal audience would be? I've just kind of been told to buy ads and not careful that, type of thing. So I'm just wondering how to start that. It's a very okay. good question. Uh, great question. And I think it's it starts with the last or parts of the last slide where when you identify the type of person you are, it helps establish the types of people you want to connect with. So for example, I find that my strengths are I like to connect on kind of a teaching level with people. I like to do that. And I, and I mean, hard as it might be for Katie to believe, I'd like to think that in certain senses, empathy is one of the things that I've got in a business sense with people. And the reason, and, but because of that, I tend to attract a lot of disasters as clients, people who just have messy situations and it's not a target of mine. So I've gone the other direction with where my messaging goes, but it's allowed me to connect really well with people in situations that need a lot of compassion and need somebody to, whether it's talk them off a ledge or deal with a really tough situation. Um, and that's helped establish the people who I connect with on the teaching side. Also, first time home buyers, people who are getting into certain markets for the first time, it tends to be the people who I, I, I guess, have the most success with and com communicate best with when they're a little bit younger than me 
um, but at life stages that maybe I've experienced over the last five to 10 years, so I can still relate with them. I think when you're trying to establish the audience that you're going after, you need to ask yourself the same questions. You know, who, wh- who are you as a person when it comes to communicating and being confident in the things that you do? Are you confident in being knowledgeable about things? Or are you more confident in connecting on more of a softer level with people where they're comfortable with the relationship as it builds? In both senses, you're going to develop a relationship, but it's in a very different context, whether it's you as the information source who's there to answer a lot of questions on a very um, you know, straight line binary approach versus the softer understanding type of person who wants to deal with people who, you know, generally need a lot of hand holding and it, it more built on a very, very strong trust factor. Um, a lot of us are going to say I'm both of those things, which is fine. But I think the more you break down almost identities of people or certain areas or things like look at the different criteria that's up here. Obviously, your immediate network for a lot of people is a spot where you're going to start. But as you branch off of that, who do you have the most comfortable conversations with? Who do you picture yourself wanting to go and spend time with? Is it buyers, sellers, investors? Um, you know, Are you analytical or the opposite of that? Right? Because we can be very good at real estate and we can know the information and deliver it, but we deliver it in different ways. If you're all about putting graphs and charts together, you're going to work with certain clients and not with others. There's some who don't want that and there's some who do. And that helps break down the types of demographics and types of people who you might want to be working with. If that's helpful, at least as a starting spark (laughs) to help you think about it. Might not know right away, but it's as you start working with different types of people, you might kind of realize that there's ones that you you enjoy and you connect better with um but as daniel said like he's been giving like a lot of those examples like even if you kind of take a look like i i think you know if somebody's looking to get into the luxury market and really want to focus in on that like what type of person do you need to be and a lot of times it's a networker you need to know people you need to you know have those back backdoor relationships where like, you know, you can make deals come together and that kind of a thing. And I remember when I was starting to think about wanting to get into luxury and I said to my, then I realized like, that's, I'm not a networker. I'm just not that type of a person that, you know, enjoys that. And really ultimately, like I can't show value in that respect. So I abandoned that idea pretty quickly, but I think if you think about these things and you kind of start going down those steps, okay, like I like doing this. I like these types of, this type of an audience. Like what does this audience need from me? And can I provide that? And do I want to provide that? And as you kind of ask yourself those questions, I think it'll become more apparent the types of people that you like working with and connect that you want to work with and those that you don't. Yeah. And, and just because you connect or just because you can do something doesn't mean it's what you like doing or want to do, right? So you need to really dive into what's going to make you the happiest also, right? Like I'm a numbers person first, but I do not want to work with investors. Like it's not an audience that interests me just because I could put together whatever analytical report. That's great. But it's just, it's not the language I speak. Like I deal with clients with humor and with taking time and understanding their story and investors are not interested in that stuff, generally speaking, right? Unless I find an investor who just wants to go for a beer and joke about stuff, maybe, but those are the sorts of things you need to ask yourself. So start big with all the things you know you're capable of, and maybe you do connect with a lot of different people and then just whittle it down to where you want your business to be, right? Geographic is a big thing as well. If you know you want to work your neighborhood, that's great. Understand what your neighborhood is or or what the farming area you're looking at is who's in it and determine how that breaks down and how that might work with your messaging um there's an ex- examples here i mean we've been talking about some young families condo owners maybe it's empty nesters um and it's really that second box that will help determine for yourself whether you're making the right call Because when you ask yourself, why do they connect with me? If you can't give a clear answer, 
doesn't mean it's the wrong answer, but it does mean you need to take a step back and ensure that you are in fact picking an audience that makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you can't think of a way they're going to connect with you, it's going to be pretty hard to start putting messages together that are authentic. Right. Because mm -hmm. a big part of this is still we don't want to create a strategy that makes you who you aren't. We we want you to grow and improve and all that, but not just change for the sake of I think this is the right thing to be doing. Right. So anybody want to chime in on the types of people they enjoy working with or? Maybe you have a, a geographic area that you that you farm right now that you enjoy farming. I've always thought first time home sellers are a big opportunity. There's they 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 need more support or they need just as much support as first time home buyers. There's a lot there that we often overlook. So that's a good good focus. Millennial and Gen X, funky, artsy, progressively minded couples, a lot of artists and creatives. I love that. That's so specific, but it's so, yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, single moms and young families. I get all the challenges. Um, love working with first-time home buyers and repeat clients. Good. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, I think having a focus on a certain type of audience, as well as building your repeat and referral business is a great way to put forward a really strong business for yourself because you want to focus on getting new people, but you also want to take care of your past clients in order to get that repeat referral business. And when you can figure out a way to work those together, it's really going to come together for you this year, which I think is really um, an important thing to recognize. I feel you, Doug. Cool. All right. All right. Who's ready to dump our brains? Me. I feel like I've been dumping my brain. Sounds like my voice is gone. I haven't even been talking that much for me. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a normal person, maybe. Um, so we've covered in the last two slides who you are and who you're talking to. And now is where it starts to come together. And this is something we're going to leave everyone with. Um, we are 15 minutes away from noon, so we're on pretty good time right now. But we want to leave everybody with this as some homework leading into tomorrow where you really sit down and make the connection between the two previous slides. You know the type of person you are or the types and you know who you're going after. This is where we start to think about the ideas that are going to connect those to actually formulate an appropriate strategy for all the things you've identified that you are and who you're talking to going forward. Um, I don't know if we had it. Did we have an example? We do. Or do you not? I yeah. think we did. Yeah. I, I just, I don't know what the next slide is. I don't want to jump into tomorrow, but, um, before we yeah. jump into that, I'm, well, actually, I guess I could just show an example. No. Ah. Oh no. I didn't, we didn't have it. Carry it forward. I'm going to, I'm going to have to dig out the example of this, but we can talk about some of it. So for, for example, let's say you are a marketer and you're focused on that that very specific group that uh, was mentioned before there, like eclectic and um, or, or, or whichever. I mean, it doesn't even matter what it, it could be, you know, young families, whatever it is. One of these or a couple of these ideas might be built around specific content strategies focused on that audience. So maybe if you're focused on which one's Gen X, I don't even know. Are we Gen X? No, we're millennials, right? Are we millennials? We're like we're 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 like the, the oldest millennials. <laughs> we're the old we're the oldest year of millennials. There we go. Yeah. We just dated ourselves. <laughs> now you know uh, how old we are. <laughs> um, but like if you're focused on that, then the feel and the content and the approach to your marketing should be built around that demographic, whether it's already talking about some sort of a recurring theme that you do, you know, let's say you're going to leverage social media in a certain way. Um, it's important to start thinking about that. Now, that being said, if you're a marketer and let's say you're focused on empty nesters or retirees, or maybe a certain market that wouldn't be as likely to be on social media, or if they are, it's a particular platform, right? Like a retiree is not going to be on TikTok but they might be on, I don't know, Facebook, LinkedIn, mm. I don't know, different, like certain areas, 
you're going to want to start thinking through the strategies that can leverage what you want to be, but that reach those people. So it's kind of the two elements of the medium, the frequency, the content. These are all things that you might be thinking about as a marketer. Whereas if you're someone like a networker, you might start thinking about, okay, where are these people physically? Where can I find them in hand-to-hand combat? Are there certain events? Can I be someone who creates events that reach people and get me face-to-face with my target market, right? Um, yeah. I don't, um, I don't know if you want so to jump in. Couple... Let me see if I can find the example one though that I can share it's just so that people can see that. I have it up if you want to let me share my screen, if that's helpful, or if you want to- Of course I do. do it. Sharing okay. is caring. Um, but I'll just get to the questions first. Um, oh, Laura sure. asked a really good one. Do you worry about leaning into connecting with your audience will alienate others? Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people worry about for sure. Um, but again, it's- To me, it's about having a focus on a certain type of audience, but that doesn't, I don't, as long as you're not going extreme, you're not necessarily alienating other people, but those just aren't the people that you're putting your messaging out towards. So you're still going to get referral business from people you've worked with in the past, or you might have a conversation with somebody at a coffee shop and end up having a good connection. They might not be your ideal audience, but you end up working with them because you had a good connection. So it's about creating a focus around a particular type of audience so that you can build your business around that while also servicing other people that come into your, to your day-to-day that you want to work with as well. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a difference too. like, you're going to have to identify how much you distinct distinguish between brand and messaging, right? Because you don't have to change your identity to match a particular targeted market necessarily, but content and strategies should be built around that target. And ideally, if they're targeted the right way, they're really only going to reach that market, right? Like those are the people who it's designed to see. Those are the people who are going to see it, share it with people who are like them. And people outside of that may just be seeing your brand, right? Like, unless you choose to go all in and make your brand like I am the dot, dot, dot realtor. And that's who you are. That will, that will alienate people potentially who fall out of that. If that's where you are everywhere as the, you know, I'm Mr. Empty Nester or whatever I call myself, right. Then people might not want to jump at me that way. But the other side of that is, For the number of realtors there are out there, and there are lots, there are tens of thousands in Ontario, tens and tens of thousands. There are so many people taking the generic approach. It does not work as effectively as the focused approach, even as it relates to what you're saying, because people who are just casting these wide nets, there's so many of them, they cancel each other out. They don't look like they're focused on anything. And the likelihood of someone who's everywhere getting a handful of generic people is lower than the likelihood of someone who's focused getting the handful of people within their focused group. And from that, the fact that you're going to have referral and repeat strategies and you know your work is going to speak for itself, whether or not you might not want to be outside of your group, that's fine. But I think for a lot of us, like we said, we're not going to want to lose business that's out there. So you do need to be cognizant of where your message is going and what it is so that it doesn't by accident alienate yourself from the masses, but it should still be focused in a particular area where the people who you want to see it are seeing something that isn't generic. They need to be something that's speaking to them because that's what's going to pop because they get 500 messages a day already. And if they're all just, I'm a great realtor and you happen to be targeting them with your Facebook ads, that's not going to do it. But if it's speaking to that subset and you're targeting them, that's kind of the secret sauce, depending again on what your strategy is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, just kind of following up because there's a bit of a follow-up on the question. Um, I'm thinking of thinking more about how my, how my people are like me opinionated and political, which people with other social views find off-putting. Um, but then I think of broke agent and his story. Yeah. So, I mean, th- yeah, that's the thing. Like 
I think it's, I think everybody takes it in a, in a different way. Some people want to be out there and, and sharing their views on, on different political issues and social issues and all that. And I, I think definitely from my experience that has brought me closer with particular people that I truly enjoy working with. Um, so it helps, it has helped me. Um, it's probably alienated a few people, but honestly, I don't really want to work with people, especially if they've got extreme opinions in the opposite direction that I do. So um, I think it's about finding that balance and figuring out what you're comfortable with at the end of the day. But I definitely see value in sharing what you're comfortable with and being um, being strong in, in what you believe in, um, if, if it's important to you. Yeah. So, so here's the example. You guys, you can see this, right? Oh, I don't. Do I need to stop sharing and then you share? Oh, maybe. Let me do Sorry. Oh, there, there it is. Go. Yep. Okay. All right. So here's some examples if you guys are having a hard time trying to figure things out. But these are all sorts. This is a massive brain dump and you could go on for pages and pages. The idea here is no idea is dumb. You can put out anything possible. Um, obviously, in the next tomorrow, we're going to be identifying the ones that are going to be your top ideas. But for now, just get it all out of your head. There's probably a lot of things that you've been thinking about over this last year, or the last few years that you've always wanted to get to, but you never have because you didn't have the time to focus on them. Put those down. They might not necessarily connect to what your goals are for this year, but it helps to just get it all out of your head because a lot of things are probably circulating in your head right now in terms of what you want to do. So you're not going to be doing them all. So yeah, get it all out there. Um, and focus on the questions that are at the top here. Cause that builds on what we were talking about before. Like what are the things that you're going to be excited to do? Right. Don't put the things down that you think are the right answer. Cause if you think they're the right answer, but you don't like them, they're the wrong answer. Right. But there's so many things that you could do. It's all the like, wouldn't it be cool if stuff is what goes here. That's kind of what you should think about it as. Wouldn't it be cool if, or I've always wanted to blank. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just remember, it's not all going to happen. So the more you put down, the better. It's yeah. a brain dump. It's not a brain like moderate squeeze. So this is your homework for tomorrow, um, because this is going to help shape your plan for next year. So if you guys can stay like right now, look at your schedule for the next, for the rest of the day and carve out 30 minutes to an hour where you can just sit down and, and go through this and just dump your brain and figure out what are the most impactful ideas that you'll want to work on over the next year. Um, Cause that's really going to set you up for, for tomorrow. And don't leave out things. If you've been working on something that you want to keep working on, don't leave that out, right? Like this isn't just the new stuff that's groundbreaking because your strategy next year might be building on stuff that's been going well for you already. So leave everything on there. Um, yeah. Oh, I can see the chat again. That's fantastic. Okay. Sorry. So nice. We're all here. Yeah. So uh, we managed to keep this to 1155. Who knew? It's so funny. We start these things and we're like, man, I don't know if this is even going to go 20 minutes. <laughs> and, and here we, we are two hours problem. later. Um, so we will stick around for a bit if anybody's got some more questions, but lots to work on there. If anybody is missing or doesn't have the, uh, the copy of the PDF, just uh, fire us a note. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> it's like you're reading my mind. If you didn't, now you do, because it's right there. <laughs> um, this session was recorded. I'm not sure when and where we're putting it up, but it'll be put up somewhere soon. But uh, I doubt anyone wants to re-listen to it today. So you've had enough <laughs> of us for today. Take away everything you've got. Reach out anytime with questions. We will be back here tomorrow, 10 a.m. Oh, but there is a question. So before we, before we go, let's answer some questions. But to everybody, if you don't have any questions, thanks for coming. Um, we will see you tomorrow. You're free to go and have some lunch. 
or come visit us at the office. We're here. <laughs> and uh, thanks a lot, guys. Great presentation. No thanks, problem. Amy. Thanks for coming. Bye, Victoria. Um, all right. So do you think farming multiple different spots that are completely different is smart in trying to figure out what's best for me? So I would say farming should be something that's more specific to one area. It's very difficult because a farming area you'll have to probably work at for at least a year to start seeing some business out of. And I don't know if there's anybody that's on the chat on the, in the group that farms a specific area. Um, but I, I know from the conversations I've had with people that do farming, it's, it's, it's a long haul. And so to focus on more than two areas is really difficult. And I'm going to hand it over to our resident expert, Nadia. <laughs> <It's off mute. laughs> I've been farming a very, like, I don't think it's a very big neighborhood. It's a thousand homes and I've been farming it pretty religiously for as long as I've been in business so like 10 years now and I religiously get a few deals per year from my farm but I the reason I picked the farm is because I used to live in the neighborhood and it was a really easy place to start my business because I knew parents in the neighborhood my kids were going to school in that neighborhood I thought like I was really passionate about the community and I still am but I don't live in the neighborhood anymore and I found it increasingly difficult to stay top of mind um, and to like continuously build out my plan. And I don't really have much of an interest in like, I know a lot of people will say like, you start with like so many homes and then you kind of like reach, like push out, push out, push out in the same neighborhood. And I'm in Mississauga now. And I've been thinking more and more about how I would like to start farming more around my home. And I've been struggling with that kind of the same question because I don't want to abandon everything that I've worked for mm -hmm. in my other farm, but I do see myself becoming less passionate about it over time and like my interests are changing a bit. So it's yeah. tough. It is. Yeah. And but I think for you though, you've established one farm area. So to add in another one might be a little bit easier than to go in with, you know, kind of doing it all at once. Um, so I, I'd say that that's probably um, a better way to go. Start with one and kind of see how it goes from there. Okay, because I was just worried about like pigeonholing myself because I don't really like I kind of stated before all I really like got focused on because of the way I was told was like Facebook ads and not yeah. focusing on like how you want to build your career. So my like my concern is putting myself in a situation that I don't end up liking thinking maybe I would for do you know what I'm trying to say like I'm just a yeah. little scared about like picking a spot and then it doesn't work out and like feeling like I need to continue on doing that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just, that's why I was back there. Yeah. Sorry. Go on, Diane. I don't know. It's all you jump in. No, no. I was just going to say that the th you, yeah, it, it's tough because you might find out that after like six months of putting the work in that you, you really don't enjoy it, which happens. But I think if you've got like a strategy where, You've got your sphere of influence, the people that you, you know, past colleagues, friends, family, like those people you're always reaching out to and staying top of mind with them, but you're also building something alongside that. Then if you do happen to abandon it because you absolutely despise what it is, you still have that business of the sphere that's hopefully building and giving you that repeat and referral business. So you don't feel like, you're going to be left with nothing at the end of the day. So I think if we can build something like that, that would be really helpful. I think uh, to, to segue to, I see the questions there, how much is reasonable to spend for your farming area, which is an interesting question because I'm, maybe it's because I'm a cheap bastard or not. I'm not sure, but I'm of the <laughs> mindset. Natty is nodding. <laughs> it's like everybody knows. I, I, I think you can't, you you have to know what you're willing to spend and definitely budgeting is important with any strategy you take on but there is not a direct correlation between the amount of money you spend and the success you're going to have and i think that's a mindset a lot of people get caught in is that if i spend like for every dollar i spend in this sort of media i should expect to get this roi in business it's not linear like that and the nice thing about building strategies that work for you is that they're not all going to be costly endeavors. So if you're talking specifically about farming, there's a ton you can do, especially when you're talking farming 
that is less about dollars and more about time invested, right? And I mean, Nadia, again, knows this better than anybody, whether it's events, whether it's just outreach that you're doing in the community, your ability to stay in touch with things and keeping people on top of what's happening in their neighborhood and being present. The nature of a farming uh, strategy is that you're part of that community. Whether you live there or not, you become embedded in what they are. And that doesn't always cost a lot of money. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't and can't invest into it. But I think when we talk budgeting tomorrow, um, it's not going to be a ton of time. It probably won't be enough to get into the specifics. Bye, Kirby. Um, I think part of what we're going to touch on, though, is the ability you've got to determine the value of the money you're choosing to spend, right? You need to evaluate the decisions you make with money before you just jump into them. And that's how you avoid dropping into that valley or living on Mount Stupid for all of your marketing, right? You need to, yeah. the more you're able to get ahead of that, the better the dollars are going to be because it's your money. Like you're an entrepreneur and every dollar you put in should be going towards something useful, not just spend and hope. And Shiva, you said before that you're a good networker. So that's a great um, strength to have in a geographic farming area. So you can definitely put that to use in ways that aren't expensive. You can, you know, even community events that you're not planning, but you can be part of them and to go out and introduce yourself and to be a helping hand and things like that. So that those types of opportunities exist as well, that I think, um, you can, you can really make you make the most of. Awesome. No other questions. We're good. All right, guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. We'll send up the recording and the PDF if you didn't get it um, later today. And uh, well, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. Cool. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.